Hello, Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of TheHappyMD.com in beautiful Seattle, Washington. Welcome to the latest episode of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. Tools so you can recognize and prevent your own burnout. Stories of burnout put to its highest and best use and wellness leadership strategies. Everything you need to be a physician on purpose. Hello again, Dr. Dyke Drummond here at the home of thehappymd.com in beautiful Seattle, Washington with the latest edition of the Physicians on Purpose podcast. My guest today, this is awesome. My guest today is Dr. Ben Mattingly, who is the founder, uh, boss, uh, chief explorer at Wild Med Adventures, wildmedadventures.com. And he's a shining example of what I'll call a free agent physician, somebody who made the decision back at the lightworkers fork in the road to become a lightworker, a helper, a healer, a doctor, and has made that career his own and blended it with his other passions for wilderness experience, nature, and wilderness medicine, and has built a very substantial, at this point, side gig on it. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple things. Side gig, he also put his ER career in a bridge position, right? He put a lid on it. And we're going to talk about how you end up living the life of your dreams when you go to medical school and decide that's not all you want in your life. So Dr. Mattingly, great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Tell me about how you decided to become a doctor. Well, it's kind of an interesting, <laughs> interesting story. I'd say first off, no one in my family was in medicine. Um, I don't know how much you read through the website, but I had a kid at 16. Um, I was on the wilder side, not wilderness medicine at that time, wild. <laughs> well, that's a trip to the wilderness right there. <laughs> <laughs> that was a trip to the wilderness early. So, uh, you know, it's interesting going through an experience like that. Um, it kind of motivates you, right? You have two types of people. You either kind of cave in, give up, say my life's over. You say, you know what? You told me I'm not going to succeed. I'll show all of you guys. I'm, you know, I took most things in life to to make it a challenge. So, so first off, I had to get serious about school. I wanted to prove that I could be a good dad and be 16 and and be successful. Um, so then when I so when I started college, I didn't really know. I thought I might be a college professor. I enjoyed teaching. Um, always have kind of enjoyed that um atmosphere and my wife um who who you know is the father of our child we've, we've been married now 28 years but she was always wanted to be a pa i don't even think i knew what a physician oh, wow. <laughs> was at that time um and she's like well you could go shadow some doctors you know i was doing good in school and i i, I shadowed one anesthesiologist and he was the coolest guy right action like running everywhere showing me stuff and i was like i could do this you know um And so that was like my first introduction. And I thought, you know, I kind of like, I think it would be fun. And I also thought I want to be a little bit different. Like I can relate to anybody, drug addict, homeless. Uh, I wanted to be somebody where, especially being in a small town, I felt like, I mean, there were great doctors, but I felt like they kind of thought they might be above certain things or okay. I I, kind of wanted to be the guy that, you know, it'd be a little bit different, you know, relate to the teenage pregnancy, relate to all types of people. So I thought it would be interesting and it was challenging um, and also knew it'd make some money because I <laughs> we desperately, you know, needed something, <laughs> something uh, um, to kind of help with the, having a family so early. So that was kind of my first introduction to medicine. And then, um, you know, so I kind of made that choice and just put all the eggs in one basket and said, let's, let's do it. Um, yeah. And then I still had. You know, I think the funny thing is once you get into medical school, it's like it doesn't really narrow down your options that much. It's like, it's like, you know, so, yeah, now why? There's a million options, you know. Um, and so, yeah, so then I just kind of enjoyed most of my rotations. Um, I actually really liked surgery, but I think having my son so young kind of was like, man, I want a family life. I want to travel. I want to do some things with my life besides, you know, necessarily just medicine. And at the time it seemed kind of malignant in a lot of places too. Um, so yeah, I kind of landed in emergency medicine, you know, it was kind of like the jack of all trades. I kind of liked everything. You get a pretty good schedule and, um, you get to punch yeah. in and punch out. Yeah. Yeah. And there's definitely benefits to that. I think as my career's, you know, 
lengthened, it's, you know, there's some things that I would enjoy about actually, you know, I mean, there's pros and cons with every option, but um, I think I may enjoy some of that continuity and actually building some relationships versus just kind of smashing through each day. Um, but yeah, no, it's been good. Right on. So, so you decided I'm an omnivore. I like people. I can get along with anybody. Um, I like, I like shift work. I'll be an ER doc. And yeah. uh, so you, you graduated, you came out and you're an ER doc. When did the itch hit to get out well, of the, to get out in the woods? <laughs> it's interesting. And I think I've seen other kind of physicians on different chat groups and stuff kind of say the same thing. It's like, you work so hard towards a goal and you finish residency and you're like, now what? Like, am I just going to go to work each day and come home? And that's like, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know if that's for me, you know, I don't, I need to, so I kind of wanted to be in academics. I kind of wanted a career, not a job. So that was just a personality for me. I thought, you no, know, I don't really care that much about money. I'd like to have something that I enjoy. Um, so I kind of knew coming out of residency, I wanted to, to do academics. Um, and so, yeah, I didn't know what that might be in academics at the time. I just thought, you know, I'd like to teach or maybe, you know, work with residents and stuff like that. And I enjoyed teaching, like I said, even from before, you know, starting college. So that was the first decision was kind of like, what environment do I want to be in? And and it really didn't hit me until two years in, after I finished residency. I stayed at my residency. I stayed at the, you know, where I went to residency. And my chair and I were great friends. And I said, ma'am, I just got a whim. I want to take my, I had three kids by the end of medical school. So I want to take my kids to um, New Zealand. I don't even know where I found out about this, right? I don't even think the internet was all that. I think, so he's like, Ben, you do what's right try for your family take them to New Zealand, enjoy it. And you'll have a job here when you get back. And so I was like, awesome. Um, it'll be like a little year break. We get to explore. And I never really traveled as a kid, right? I, I, I had never been West of the Mississippi. Oh I, didn't, my. Didn't, I didn't get in an airplane. <laughs> not, until not in, not in Kentucky anymore. <laughs> no. And I'd never been in a, and I'd never been in an airplane until medical school. Oh, wow. Um, so I did residency in Massachusetts, went to New Zealand. We packed up all three kids, 15, nine and six two bags each. And we went over there for a year and I practiced emergency medicine. Okay. So you did work over there. Yeah. Which was kind of eye opening. And the reason I mentioned this story is kind of the beginning of sort of my branch into wilderness medicine. Um, I'd always loved the outdoors. I got into rock climbing in college. I'd take the kids out, you know, we would take them with us on all kinds of different camping trips and stuff. But when I went to New Zealand, they were starting one of the first wilderness life support courses outside of the United States. And it was with the guys I was working with and I became good friends with them. So like, Ben, you should help teach, you know, our advanced wilderness life support course. It's in uh, Queenstown. So I got in teaching some wilderness medicine. I was like, wait a second. Your first gig was teaching wilderness medicine in New Zealand. In New Zealand. Yeah. Now yes. I understand what you said earlier. Yeah, I, some of it seems to be luck. <laughs> some of it was luck, right? I, I, would say, a, I would say it's fate. <laughs> some of it was a random decision to go to New Zealand, which then I met the guy, just so happened to be the guys that were running one of the first wilderness courses. Right. I hit it off with all of them and I, I like fell in love with New Zealand and the people there. And so that year ended, we almost stayed there. Like we really enjoyed it. But when I came back, my chair was like, it was a new chair. He said, listen, if you want to stay in academics, what's going to be your niche? I said, well, I'll start a wilderness medicine fellowship. <laughs> Give me two years. Uh, Cause at the time there were only like maybe six in the country, you know, Stanford was the only wilderness fellowship that was available when I finished residency. That's um, a little so, bit of ways away from the wilderness, but you cross the Central Valley, you're in the, you're in the <laughs> Sierra Nevada. Yeah. So I was, so it was kind of, you know, random. I, and at the time we were grandfathered in through the Wilderness Medical Society, you could get your fellowship through their academy, you know, fellowship academy of wilderness medicine through the WMS Society. So I got those certifications. I was like, well, I'm into rock climbing. I got big into backpacking. I was like, I need to know more about mountaineering. I got into all the ski and snow sports in Massachusetts. So I took a, a mountaineering course and I really enjoyed it. And I had one of the residents at the time, he goes, Ben, if you start this fellowship, man, I'll be your first fellow. Like me and him are already pretty good friends, right? He went back to school late. So I was like, there it is. It's set up. I got my first fellow. I finished all the paperwork. I started the You're fellowship. Off the schneid. And then it was off. Um, and then my whole like climbing, it was kind of, you know, so when Joe, my first fellow, decided to sign up, I said, man, let's go climb this mountain called Aconcagua down in South America. There you go. 
<laughs> I didn't know a lot about the seven summits and every, I mean, I'd always kind of liked climbing and kind of kept it in my, you know, I knew, you know, some knowledge, read some books and stuff. And your wife rolls her eyes and says, there he goes again. <laughs> yeah. What's he, what's he doing? You know? <laughs> so we climbed that mountain and I met a, a paramedic down there and some other, a bunch of other docs. And I said, man, I want to run CME trips doing this stuff. Um, and we climbed that first peak and I became good friends with the owner of Andy's mountain guides. And he's like, well, we do some medical education. You want to climb Karsten's pyramid? And I was like, man, I've never heard of it, but I'll do it. <laughs> um, and so there it kind of got started to where the teaching and then, um, you know, wilderness medicine became much more of a part of my career. Um, and so I was working, but I had some protected time and I was running the fellowship. And at that time we hadn't started wild med adventures. Um, we kind of had in the back of our minds, my wife and I too, in New Zealand, we were like, we'd like to run courses like they're running down here. We could go wherever we want. Um, but we had young kids and running the fellowship and stuff. So we, yeah, need, so that part... we need more tax deductible <laughs> wilderness <laughs> trips. Yeah. And I didn't even understand that at the time, but I do now. <laughs> you do now. <laughs> I do now. <laughs> but what's funny is I really wanted different experiences for my fellows. Right. So like, you know, there's some societies, but they could go do a 30 minute hotel talk. But like, I want them to have hands on travel wherever they want to go, help plan the expedition. I and mean, so Wild Med Adventures actually started for the fellows. I was like, if we create this company, we have clients come, they can teach, you know, be reduced price or free or whatever we can afford. And they can help me plan a trip. So one of the fellows is like, I want to go to Mongolia and climb. I'm like, all right, give me like a month. I was like, we, we set it up and we got people signing up. I'm like, all right, look at the ages of this group. Where's the nearest hospital? Where's the communications? What are we going to pack? How much can we carry? What's the weight? I mean, they got to start thinking, you got to start thinking through a lot of logistical um, things to put a trip together for all of our trips. But so yeah, it kind of started. So Wild Med Adventures formed mainly to kind of help the fellows get experiences doing things. And then we'd meet people on a trip and they're like, why don't you do mountain biking? I'm like, yeah, why don't we, why don't you go fishing in Montana? Okay, let's do it. So it kind of grew to different experiences over, you know, for five, six, seven years. Um, but then COVID hit, which kind of put a crumble to the, to the, um, travel. And then, you know, our daughter graduated high school and we we're like, you know, maybe it's time to move back to Kentucky, get a farm, focus on wild make. We really enjoyed it do community medicine or try to work less. We'll also be near our parents as they're getting older, you know, so a little bit more freedom. Um, and then just some of the politics and the admin stuff for, you know, academics starts kind of wearing down on you too. You just meetings and stop reimbursing things for the fellows and trying to get their experiences. And I mean, it became a lot of, you know, headache. Whereas while how long men, were you an academic it. for? What was your total? I was for? there. Well, counting residency, I was at Bay State seventeen years. Okay. Um, so let's see. So fourteen of that was yeah. Was most, most people who aren't long term compatible with academics and don't become a department chair last about ten years. So you're a little longer than average. Yeah. yeah. But you were able to incorporate. You were able to blend your wilderness, your urge to teach, your urge for wilderness even event, but let's call it event planning, expedition planning. I mean, yeah. those kind of things are specialties of their own and have their own creative edge, right? Yeah, and it definitely, I mean, that was my, right? Yeah, I mean, that was my happy place or that was the thing that really kept me, kept my drive going. Um, and I had some limited clinical time, which also helped, but I mean, running that fellowship, I mean, I became great friends with all of them. I love planning the trips. I mean, you know, so that amount of time I was dedicating to that didn't seem like a job, you know, right. it was my passion. It was, you know, I enjoyed it. Um, but now you're coming home and yep. now you're, now you're not going to be an academic. So these two activities are going to pull themselves apart. There's going to be your clinical practice and there's going to be wild men adventures. Right. So yeah. what was that transition like? Yeah. So I, I mean, I was lucky in my hometown where I grew up, I started, I signed on a contract doing eight twelves, which was kind of like three quarters time. Um, and they were great with working around my schedule for, you know, they, I told them when I came, like, look, I do a lot of traveling. I mean, I'm happy to do, you know, certain percentage of shifts, whatever you need, but you know, I just want to be up front. I don't want to sign on for a job and then ask for all these days off. Like I just want to be upfront about it. Um, 
And so they did a really good job over the last couple of years, kind of working around my schedule. The problem was, you know, there was a couple, there was, there was basically day shifts were almost taken. So I ended up finding myself, I get back from a trip kind of tired and I'd be thrown on three, you know, overnight shifts, 12 hours. And it's a bu pretty busy place. And I was like, man, I need more control than this. I know eight doesn't sound like much, but like, I'm like, I just would really love to actually focus on the wild men adventure part. Like I've never really given it my full attention. You know, it's kind of like, we've learned a few things. We run our own website. We run our own face. We, you know, I go to my daughter and say, how do you run Instagram? You know, like I'm, I've learned all this on our own. So I was like, it'd be nice, especially with COVID. What we saw after COVID is people really have a desire to want to travel. I think if, uh, if there was one positive from COVID, I think it made us slow down and say, you know, what's important in life. Maybe I need to spend more time doing the activities I love. Maybe it's, I need to work less. Maybe I need to spend more time with my family, whatever it may be for each individual person. I think the travel kind of has been shooting up since then. Um, so we found ourselves starting to fill more trips, um, and realize that this probably has more potential. We could probably do more of a side gig. You know, that's where that sort of bridging is coming. And I decided to go locums, um, to where I could control my schedule. Um, I could also control what shift I want to work, you know, so, you know, one well, you I, have you have the power to say yes or no to individual sh exactly. individual shifts one at a time, right? Right. Perfect. I mean, it's a little scary at first because you're like, well, what if things dried up? What if there's another pandemic? What if? Uh, <laughs> well, and in the last in the last three months, the entire ER industry has collapsed around it. I mean, I mean, fallen to the earth like somebody imploding a, a stack at an old factory, <laughs> and you probably have more opportunities than you could ever deal with right yeah and i think i think like a lot of people are feeling like i was i think i sort of avoided the the bit you know some of that burnout by my by incorporating my passion into it but i mean there's definitely things after 15 20 years of doing this job it's like right um, i think people with covid especially is just like man the appreciation the demands of admin understaffed you know i compare it to flying a plane it'd be like the pilot shows up to work Co-pilot calls out sick. They duct tape the wing and they say, fly anyway. You crash the plane and they say, God, you're a terrible pilot. Why'd you, what did you do? You know, the guy in row six didn't get his ginger ale on time on that landing. You know? Right, right. There we go. And you're, this you're, guy, he, you're spilled his, he spilled his ginger ale when your wheels hit the ground. What's wrong with you? You're just glad no one died. You know, you're like, no one died. You understand that, right? The, 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 there was no stewardess. Well, and it wasn't even a passive no one died. You saved three lives that night and no one died. Yeah. You skated yeah. the edge. <laughs> but the aspirin wasn't given in six and a half minutes. You know, like, do you realize what was going on? So I think that, I think most of us like the medicine. I love going in and bonding with the patients. If you get to know them, the problem is you don't have four seconds to actually look through their history to actually take adequate care of them. And so... I think what we're realizing is, is that it's not so much the medicine as the burden of the system uh, and, and, and some of these things that we can't feel like we can't control, which we can. I mean, it's harder for some individuals with kids in school and stuff to move, but like there's lots of different jobs, lots of different opportunities that may fit what you would actually enjoy. But it's also scary to take that leap of faith when you have loans and children and people depending on you. So I think all those things kind of go into some of the you know, I guess what we call like burnout is that we feel like some of these things aren't controllable by us. And that's a bad feeling. Well, know? that's, that's the interesting thing. And let, let's just use you as a, as a shining example. Um, and I'm going to ask a question that maybe some other people are thinking about right now, some people that are listening. How did you get to be so brave? Yeah, I mean, how did you get to, to be 16? I got a kid. Heck yeah, I'm going full speed ahead. Med school, I'm in. Hey, I, I'm I'm just going to bull my way into whatever seems like the most likely thing. And there never seems to be a smidgen of fear that comes into your awareness. <laughs> you talked about it intellectually there for just a second. You gave it lip service for one sentence, thinking about loans and kids and all that stuff. But it, if I look at your life from 20,000 foot, it seems to me that you're a very, very, very courageous person. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, I think some of it is just maybe certain personality, maybe a certain way you were raised. I mean, I, I, I mean, you know, we've had, we've had things we come into discussion, my wife and I, and it's like, there's certain things in people you can't, I don't know if you can teach motivation. I think you can. Some of it comes naturally for some people, you know, um, I think the, you know, having that confidence, um, 
allows you to say, I'm not going to take garbage or I have confidence in myself that I can find an opportunity. I mean, I, I would never go hungry, right? I would pick weeds out of someone's driveway. It doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter what avenue. I think like, um, and I feel like if you, if you're in a toxic work environment, I think you have to have that leap of faith that you've done your due diligence to have a different opportunity and be successful at it. Um, and some of that may just be personality or the way you're raised, you know, I mean, definitely different people struggle with, um, different aspects of that, you know, for me, and maybe it's the same. It's maybe why I love mountain climbing and some of these things. It's, it's a, it's a challenge, you know, and, 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 and a reward sort of situation, but like putting the training in, putting the hard work in and realizing that you will be, you can be successful. Um, well, and the other thing that I notice about you is, um, one of the things I do when I meet people who are burned out, because a lot of times as a coach, I'll only meet people who are pretty much struggling, pretty much struggling so bad they're willing to ask for help. And that's a big mountain. Most most doctors don't climb. There's a lot of internal programming that says don't ask for help. It's a sign of weakness, that kind of stuff. But you're a person who seems to live on the positive side of things. You're you're governed, it would appear, by what you want. Not, yeah. what, you, not what you don't want. I'd rather have this. So I'm gonna so I'm gonna go for yeah. this too. Not that, you know, talking in, you know, 30 minute podcasts. I mean, obviously I've had my weaknesses and my, um, doubts and my own burnout and there's sure. times where I struggle. I mean, that's just, I, I mean, that I think is, you know, part of just being a human, but, um, and so not all of it is easy decision, you know, easy decisions along the way. I think it's realizing the things that are important to you, whether it's time with your family and stuff, and then saying, I'm going to try to make this, make this happen. But, right. um, definitely you know walking into new environments and ERs with new systems I mean that's also very stress can be very stressful um and so yeah there's a there's definitely um I'm I consider myself a pretty positive person but there's definitely times where I've been very negative about working in the emergency department in certain situations so I would not say like if you're listening to this like oh it's just easy for him no it's I'm just, I didn't I, say like, easy no, no, no. Yeah, not you. But I mean, I have the same sort of struggles. I probably maybe have found some techniques to manage those. Um, well, and what I what I want to say is um, one of the things that I've realized coaching thousands of different doctors is that you always have choices available. You yes. always have choices available. One of the things that being beat down and burned out will do is it will cloud your consciousness to the choices that are available and you'll put your head down and stay stuck where you are out of that fear. I know, I know if I go yes. to work and I, and I churn like this, I'm going to get that paycheck and those benefits and I'll at least maintain what I've got. If I change what I'm doing, I might lose everything. And I got yeah. student loans and all that kind of stuff. What I know is you always have choices available. One of them is to stop tolerating less than ideal for you and to focus on what you really want. If it's not this, if this is not what you really want, the, the, just an example for you, right? You know, I don't want to work, you know, somebody else, hand somebody else my schedule and have them stick me on nights all the time after I come home from vacation. Right. Simple choice. How can I get control over my schedule? Oh, I'll become a locums, right? Yeah. So those kinds of simple choices and the availability of some really cool jobs these days out there. Say, if you don't like your situation, dear listener, <laughs> interview decide what you want and go do some interviews and find something that's better for you because no, you, you can yeah. even build an entire multi-person wilderness three continent how many continents <laughs> you on now five continents. i think we've been on all of them <laughs> okay and and it's still just a side gig he's just getting started so here yeah. we are you're in a stable configuration of locums on the side wilderness uh medicine uh, uh wild mid adventures as dual focuses in your life foci in your life what is your vision for what happens next? And let's say the next 10 years. Yeah. I mean, I think like where I kind of took that leap of faith doing locums, I mean, I would love to build it up, um, wild med adventures to where it becomes, you know, where I'm not relying on shifts and maybe when I'm hitting 50, 55, 60, that I'm maybe not doing shifts, you know, maybe I'm just doing a few and, 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 and then doing some other things with medicine that I enjoy international stuff. Um, so where I would love to go would be able to obviously, you know, expand wild med adventures to where that bridge becomes where I've almost shifted. Um, 
to where I'm doing that almost, you know, full time. Um, and I don't know, you know, it might be five years, it might be 10. I don't mind the clinical. So I still enjoy that side of things. So I think trying to find that balance and I don't want to grow it. I want the clients or physicians, whoever comes on the trip, I want their experience to be the same. So I don't want to just, I don't want it to be big if I, if it's not right. ran the way we right. want it. So to me, if it never gets any bigger, that's okay. But I'd like to at least fill the trips that we have, you know, and have, uh, how's that uh, going? It's going good. Yeah. It's really kind of since COVID, like the first year, now what we're seeing is people want to have these experiences. So yeah, it's going, it's going really well. Um, yeah. The travel you know, industry t statistics show that recreational travel is back setting new records, all-time records, yeah, but yeah. business travel, I do a lot of traveling and speaking and for organizations, business travel is still about 60, 70% of what it was before COVID. Yeah. So you're on the right side of, of the curve there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and you know, some trips, we just enjoy them. It's not going to make, you know, we're not trying to make, you know, we get to go, we get to enjoy the trip. Um, Tell me a little bit about two or three trips that are coming up. Yeah. So we have, um, well, we have a couple, uh, one of the big international trips at the end of September, we're going to the Amazon peacock bass fishing. Um, so we'll fly in and then do float planes into the, you know, and, <laughs> wow the amazon yeah so it's a tell big me trip. about a peacock bass <laughs> well you know what they're wild looking if you've never seen a picture they can be huge and they got beautiful colors um and they're only there are some smaller ones i think around like florida and other places but these are some of the biggest in the world that are in the amazon um so it's kind of a unique experience um and some of these what's interesting is i love i like to fish i'm not a huge fisherman our clients came to Montana fly fishing with us. Then they said, well, you got to put together a trip to Patagonia. So I put that <laughs> together. We're in Patagonia. They're like, when are we going to do the peacock bass fishing? So I'm learning from these guys. Right. Um, and so that's kind of how some of our trip ideas come. It's from our clients or things. they Right wanna... on. Um, so, yeah, so we're excited to do that. And then every year we run a Kilimanjaro trip, um, which I'm excited to host again um, in January. Um, but we run some wellness. We have a couple wellness retreats coming up in October that are different than just big expeditions, um, where we'll basically go to Keeneland. We talk about a lot of these issues. That's a racetrack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keeneland racetrack in Kentucky. And we'll do some bourbon tours and have various talks on, you know, things that I think that we're all facing in today's sort of medical, you know, environment. Um, but and yeah, we pretty much run point, one or two a month. At this point, how, of the trips that you run out of Wildman Adventures, how many of them do you lead? Uh, so my wife and I are on probably eighty percent. But are, are you the lead? Are you the the on the ground logistical leader of that? Yes, you're working. Yeah. yeah. Now, if we if we you know a lot of times if it's a mountain trip, we hire guides. So our big right, thing right. on the side is like, hey, we're educators. Um, you know, we do our homework with guides, but we can't get you know so they'll do a lot of the logistics, but a lot of the other stuff. Yeah. My wife and I do. And, and I've got a core group of instructors now. They're just amazing friends that I know when they run a trip, it's going to be as good or better than what I do. Right. So, um, it, it used to be that we were on all the trips um, right? and it's a lot of responsibility, right? So what's funny is you'll find friends, you know, like everybody loves them. I mean, everybody loves this guy and he'll show up and be like, dude, I didn't do the lectures. It snowed two feet in Tahoe. And you're like, come on. Like we take the learning serious or you find the guy that's really good with his lectures, but he's like, I don't know, he comes off arrogant or something. So we have a very specific way that we want our courses ran. And so it's, it's kind of, it's harder than you'd think to, you know, cause it represents us, you know, so that experience is extremely important for us, um, people's experience. And we try to make it to where, you know, they don't have to do anything. We're so busy all the time. You don't want to think. So we just like show up. We have the transportation. We have the dive boat. We right. have the tips included. We have the equipment. Right. Just pay one price, show up, and you don't have to get your wallet out. Our drinks are included, you know, just come and enjoy. And so I think that, yeah, so I think it, it makes it a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I lead a retreat where we pick them up at the airport, drive and take the ferry to Orcas Island, stay at an old 1800s resort. And then float plane back Lake Union flying around. One day, we one time we flew right around the Space Needle. You can see people waving it to us from the float <laughs> plane. The trip's just 10 because that's how many people can fit in yeah. the float plane. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I mean, it's similar to what I'm doing. I enjoy it. A lot of our trips may have, you know, some of the fish trips may have 10, 12. Some of them may have 
you know, 20, but it's always a pretty small group. Now we do some certification courses that are, you know, 35 plus, but it's more of just full out training gotcha. versus like destination training. Gotcha. Well, it's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. I'm inspired yes. by your life journey. Thank you for being transparent with us about all the things you've had to go through and, how you, and your humble beginnings, as we shall say, right? You are the most gregarious, friendly, uh, uh, look at the bright side person I've met in a long time. Uh, so congratulations on who you are at this stage in your medical yeah. career. I wish you the best of luck going forward in Wild Men Adventures. And then tell us the best way to reach you. Is Wild Men Adventures, are you on other platforms, Instagram and all that kind of stuff? Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so just wildmedadventures.com is our main website, but we're on YouTube, Instagram, um, Facebook. Same, same uh, thing, Wild Med Adventures? Yep, Wild Med Adventures. Yeah, and then we have a Twitter. I'm not as active on it as I probably should be, um, but we we do have a, you know, a Twitter account and LinkedIn. And um, for those of you who can't see us, we're on YouTube as a video. We're also on uh, our podcast. It's just audio. It's Wild Med, W-I-L-D-M-E-D, adventures.com. And this has been Dr. Ben Mattingly. Pleasure. It's a pleasure, brother. Yeah, pleasure meeting you. Thanks you for rock, having me. You rock on, okay? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> and until our next Physicians on Purpose podcast, everybody here is listening or watching us, keep breathing and have a great rest of your day. 